Good afternoon and welcome to the, uh, the smart event organized by EU News with the collaboration of Carni Sostenibili and European Livestock Voice, Food and Farming, What Future for Europe. Um, my name is Angelo Di Mambro. I, am, um, I cover the, in, in, the news on, from, from the EU on food, agriculture, environment and climate for the Italian news agency ANSA and for other media outlets. Uh, I'm the moderator of, of this uh, uh, meeting before starting some technical information. Uh, simultaneous translation is provided for the entire duration of the event. Uh, you can find uh, the, uh, the, sim the translation is from uh, Italian to English and vice versa. And uh, you can find at the bottom of the screen on the right, uh, the button for interpretation. Uh, it's a word-like icon. Uh, and uh, you can push it and select the, your your language and follow the, uh, the 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 meeting in your in your in the language you prefer. Uh, second, uh, um, we listen to to speakers' view, but we also invite you to submit questions. Uh, please use the chat for the questions, uh, and we'll try to take as many of them as possible. Um, so today we we have a distinguished panel uh, for, for talking about the topic of the food, the, the future of food production in Europe. Um, we have uh, Claire Bury, uh, Deputy Director General, DG Health and Food Safety at the European Commission. Uh, we have Luigi Scordamaglia, uh, he's a president of Assocarni, that is the Italian Meat and Livestock Association, and spokesperson of Carni Sostenibili, the Italian uh, association with the aim of promoting sustainable production and conscious consumption of meat. Then um, Herbert Dorfman will be joining us. Herbert Dorfman, MEP, coordinator of the EPP group, group sorry, for agriculture and one of the rapporteurs for the farm to fork strategy uh, uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, Gitte Guteland, um, MEP uh, from the Environment Committee, uh, group s and uh, uh, already rapporteur on the EU climate law that was uh, finalized in principle uh, two weeks ago. Um, Pekka Pesonen, uh, Director General of Copa in Kojica, the umbrella organizations of European farmers and agricultural cooperatives. So let's uh, jump into the topic of, of the day. Um, it is the, the, the future of, of, of uh, food and farming. Um, in May 2020, uh, the Commission tabled the farm to fork strategy. Uh, after years of discussions of, of, on the need of a system approach uh, to food systems in Europe, the European Commission has delivered. Um, we have a, a, an action plan, uh, a proposed action plan uh, on. Uh, on sustainability in food systems. And this is also timely because we know that in July and in September, there will be two important meetings uh, uh, of United Nations on uh, food systems. Um, the goal of green transition is not discussed by anybody. It's, uh, I, I've heard any, nobody, nobody um, against it. Uh, some sectors, however, are voicing concern. Uh, on how to reach the green, the green transition. Um, the livestock and meat sector, for instance, uh, is worried about the impacts of, of, of this action plan uh, on, on the future of the sector. Uh, so they launched uh, an appeal and, and uh, uh, back in March with a video uh, to raise awareness on their concern and asking to uh, policymakers, invite policymakers to engage on that. Uh, so, and it's today we will start this process in a sense, in a public way. Um, we'll hear from various speakers about the, this issue and about the contribution that the, 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 the livestock sector, the, the meat sector, um, and the livestock and meat supply chain can give to the green transition. Uh, before starting, I'm, I'm almost over. Before starting, uh, just uh, uh, to say that every speaker will have five, six minutes for a, an introductory remark. Then I will, uh, um, I will ask a round of questions for each speaker. And uh, finally, we will have a Q&A session. Um, uh, uh, of course, uh, you are invited to use the chat and uh, 
uh, I will uh, I will give you more uh, detailed information when it will be the moment. Um, so let's start. The, 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 the first to uh, invite to take the floor is uh, Claire Bury from the European Commission that proposed, actually tabled the, the farm to fork strategy. And um, what, is, what, is, what are your thoughts on, on these uh, concerns that I'm sure you have heard as the commission is used to, 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 to listen to every stakeholders? What are your thoughts on, on, that, on that concerns from, from, the, uh, from the livestock emit sector? Five minutes, six minutes uh, for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Angelo, and good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much to EU News, to the European Livestock Voice, and to Carne Sostenibile uh, for uh, putting this webinar together. Uh, it's very timely, I think, and of course we are well aware of the concerns that you mentioned, Angelo. And I'll come to those in a second. But before I do that, I just would like to say. A few words about the farm support strategy more generally and the lessons that we've tried to learn from the COVID crisis. Um, and then I'll go into more of this question of the, the livestock sector and the concerns and the role of the sector and so on. So, as you said at the beginning, uh, the farm support strategy is an essential part of the, the European Green Deal. It takes this integrated food system approach, which had been much talked about, but which is now uh, reflected in, in the policy. And it tries to set out a long term strategic vision. Uh, to transform the way we produce, distribute and, and consume uh, food. Uh, it looks at sustainability in its three dimensions, that's to say environmental, social and, and economic. And I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has made us acutely aware of the interrelations between our health, our ecosystems, our supply chains, our consumption patterns, and, and indeed, if I can use that term as a big term, but the planetary boundaries, uh, you know, the challenges that we have in terms of living on this planet. Uh, it's underlined how much we need to transform our food system and that we need to do it now. Uh, without this, our food system won't be resilient to future disruptions if it's not sustainable. And so I think uh, the ideas set out in the farm support strategy try to address this need so that we have a fairer, healthier, environmentally and friendly food system uh, that will be resilient. Obviously the pandemics had important economic repercussions across society and all the actors in the food chain. We're very aware of the economic impact of the pandemic and we hope that uh, the farm to fork strategy will support the economic recovery. Because if we can have a sustainable food system, uh, it needs to guarantee a fair earning for all actors on the food chain, as, is, as we set out in the, in the farm to fork strategy. Um, so we need all the actors on board nobody can be left behind. So that brings me then, I think, to the, to the role of the livestock sector, um, which clearly has its part to play in the transition. Uh, animal production is present in almost all regions of the European Union, and it's a very important uh, part of our economy. Uh, but its social importance, I think, goes beyond employment, because a lot of our landscapes, our cuisines, the way we live our lives, are associated very closely with, with animal production. So the livestock sector is a major contributor to the European economy. Uh, I think all those present know the figures uh, probably even better than I do, but in, in 2017, uh, the value of animal production and animal products in the EU 28 amounted to 170 billion euros, which is 40% of the total agricultural turnover. So this is really a significant weighty uh, part of the agricultural economy. We're also a net exporter of livestock products in the world market. Therefore, we can't achieve this transition uh, to sustainable food systems without active engagement from this very strong agricultural sector, which I think is why uh, the discussions we're having today are so important. Um, but let's have a look at the impacts of the livestock sector. So we can't deny, I think, uh, that the livestock sector has some negative uh, impacts on the environment. This is due uh, to the consumption of resources and the production of physical flows, such as nutrients and, and the greenhouse gases that affect biodiversity, human health, and ultimately uh, the functioning of our, of our ecosystems on which the food production depends. But the challenges relating to the livestock sector are not limited, I think, to environmental issues. Because, and this has been brought home to us very clearly with the COVID pandemic, because humans and animals share the same pharmacopoeia, it's important to reduce the use of antimicrobials in livestock uh, to mitigate the risk of antimicrobial resistance. We, we are very much focused on COVID for the moment, uh, but behind that is this even bigger worry, this even bigger beast and shadow of antimicrobial resistance, uh, which is a real threat to, to, to life on the planet. So obviously, um, we need to work uh, towards better animal health using fewer 
uh, antibiotics. And we also need, I think, to move to be towards better animal welfare. This is one of the issues which is being very actively discussed in the European Parliament for the moment, the end cage age petition. Um, we've seen some terrible examples of uh, animal transport that's gone badly wrong in the last uh, few months as well. So really animal welfare uh, is also at the top of the agenda. And obviously there is another question which is around nutritional patterns. Um, where average intakes of energy, sugar, salt, and fats, and high, level, uh, high levels in diets of proteins of animal origin exceed dietary recommendations, uh, causing obesity and non-communicable diseases. So we need to have better balance in, in diets. But I'll come back to that in a moment because I know this is, um, this is a challenging issue for, for this sector. Right? So moving now to what can be done in terms of uh, livestock sustainability, Let, let's call it that. Huh? I think by improving uh, the sustainability of animal production. We want to put uh, and maintain uh, this sector in the middle of our food system. So reducing its negative impacts and optimizing its positive effects through having sustainability of animal production. A lot has been done already. Um, I think I would like to uh, very clearly put on record our thanks uh, to the sector for the work that's already been done. Uh, but there are, I think, other gains that can be made through efficiency gains by using low impact inputs and exploiting agricultural systems and synergies. Uh, there's more to be done. I hope we can discuss that today. But the farm support strategy paves the way for a renewed and rejuvenated agriculture. We need to move away from simplistic positions. And, and here I go back to the dietary issue. It's not about plants against animals. It's not about extensive production against intensive production. We need to really promote systems that are well suited towards our goals and the diversity that we need and which are well balanced. Science is important in all that, of course, um, but also research and innovation are hugely important to the way forward here. Um, and uh, we were mentioning, of course, last week, the Commission came up with its uh, study on the new uh, genomic techniques, uh, which we hope will, will now stimulate uh, a very uh, fruitful and open debate about how we use these techniques going forward and, and how we help farmers to, to innovate there. So our, what we expect of our farmers, of course, is, is a big ask, but we ask that they produce healthy and sustainable food that meets consumer preferences and expectations at the prices that the consumers are willing to pay. Uh, now, of course, that's not always easy, and we know uh, and the farm to fork strategy recognizes that, that sometimes the farmers get squeezed in all this, you know, that they are the ones that are losing out in terms of their revenue and, and farmers need to be able to invest. Uh, so we have to get that balance right. So we don't try to set targets in relation to meat and other animal products consumption. Um, we recognize there are issues to be addressed, but we don't say uh, they should be achieved specifically in any given way. What we talk about is, is having a balanced diet and to um, have better adequacy between dietary uh, and nutritional guidelines. So I'd like to just conclude by saying, um, I think after COVID, we can't just go back to business as usual. Uh, we think that uh, we can now build up at EU level. I think this provides us with an impetus for using the ideas and the central goals of the farm support strategy and doing some bold actions, uh, making some difficult political choices but again, I think we have to do this together. And of course, we have to do it with the livestock sector. There are no sustainable or unsustainable food sectors per se. I think there are some sustainable and unsustainable business practices, but there are no sectors which are unsustainable. So we have to work to make all of them uh, sustainable. Livestock is an essential part of our EU agriculture. It's an essential part of our EU food system. Um, and it's part of the solution. I think it is not the problem. It is part of the solution. and I. I'm confident, and, and I hope we'll hear that still further today, that this sector uh, is embracing the change, uh, difficult though it may be in certain ways, but as you said, I think at the beginning, Angelo, everybody recognizes that the destination, that the, the, the direction of travel that we're going in now in terms of the, the Green Deal and the objectives set there. So I would invite uh, this sector to help, to come on board, to help us by responding to all the consultations that we do and there being an active part of the various proposals that we now have as part of the farm to book strategy. So I'm looking forward to a, a constructive discussion and I hope this is gonna be a step forward uh, in the work that we'll do together to realize the Green Deal and the farm to book strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Claire Bury, um, for, for this comprehensive overview of, of the farm to fork strategy uh, and uh, of, uh, of uh, the, uh, 
uh, thanks for the, the reply to the to the to the to some of the concerns that the livestock secretary is, is has raised has raised in in, in recent times. Now. Um, I will uh, give the floor to Luigi Scordamaglia, uh, the, the, the president of uh, Astrocarni, that is the, uh, uh, that is the Italian uh, Meat Sector Association, um, and uh, um, spokesperson of Carni Sostenibili. Uh, what's the message for uh, the EU institutions today from, from, the, from the meat sector and livestock sector? Grazie, grazie a tutti, grazie Angelo. Eh, devo dire, eh, sono molto grato anche a Clara, rappresentante della Commissione, per la posizione di grande equilibrio che ha voluto esprimere. Noi partiamo da un punto in comune, la Far to Fork è un'opportunità unica per la filiera agroalimentare europea, irripetibile. Dobbiamo però stare attenti perché accanto a questa straordinaria opportunità c'è un rischio. Il rischio cioè che questa transizione verde non sia guidata da numeri, dati, analisi razionali, ma da approcci ideologici, perché se facessimo prevalere gli approcci ideologici sarebbe da opportunità, si trasformerebbe in una sconfitta non solo per i produttori, ma anche per i consumatori europei. Ecco perché European Livestock Boys, Carni Sostenibili, hanno realizzato questo video appello che poi mostreremo di nuovo, in cui cerchiamo di dare risposte oggettive, razionali, a preconcetti che crescenti abbiamo visto nei confronti della carne, del latte e delle altre produzioni zootecniche europee. Volevo farvi vedere una slide un, pro, un po' provocativa, ma solo perché affermazioni di questo tipo meritano di essere approfondite insieme. Sono affermazioni sicuramente fatte in buona fede, ma di chi ha una visione troppo urbana, troppo lontana dalla realtà reale degli allevamenti, perché dire che la zootecnia è estensiva e l'unica soluzione è quella intensiva dovrebbe essere eliminata perché lontana dagli agricoltori è semplicistico, falso e pericoloso. Veniva detto prima, ma grazie alla cosiddetta zootecnia intensiva l'Europa è riuscita a dare food ad una popolazione crescente dagli anni 60 di 125 milioni di persone, ma lo ha fatto in maniera sostenibile senza aumentare la superficie di terreno destinata al pascolo e soprattutto riducendo del 20% per ogni chilo di proteina prodotta le emissioni di CO2 equivalenti, mentre il resto del mondo, ricordiamocelo, va in direzione opposta. Un dato, per produrre un chilo di carne rossa in Europa ci vuole un quinto delle emissioni di produrre lo stesso chilo di carne in Asia o negli Stati Uniti. È chiaro che chi conosce il sistema lo sa, se tu raccogli in un allevamento contenuto, controllato, le deiezioni degli animali, produci biogas, produci energia elettrica e oggi sempre più sapremo produrre biometano che è l'unico carburante sostenibile per le nostre flotte di camion distributive e per le nostre macchine agricole, in un perfetto esempio di economia circolare. Siamo come Italia quarti al mondo per la produzione di biogas grazie agli scarti agricoli ed allevamento e questo ci ha portato ad avere un impatto numerico delle emissioni di CO2 dalla zootecnia al 4,4%, mentre il resto, l'energia e i trasporti valgono il 65%. Allora è giusto impegniamoci a cambiare la dieta razionalmente ma cambiamo anche le nostre abitudini perché viaggiare in aereo per una sola persona da Roma a Bruxelles emette più CO2 che il consumo di carne di quella stessa persona in un intero anno. Altra fake news, non è giusto considerare la zootecnia come sottraente risorse preziose all'uomo. Il bovino, parliamo di bovino e un ruminante, è un equilibrio perfetto che trasforma quello che l'uomo, i vegetali non adatti al consumo umano, in proteine ad altissimo valore nobile. E il 92% dell'alimentazione bovina non è utilizzabile dall'uomo. Ancora, il letame. Il letame è oggi una ricchezza naturale senza il quale assistiamo ad una crescita della fertilizzazione chimica. L'Italia è prima ancora una volta per numero di aziende biologiche, ma si sta fermando perché non ha abbastanza fertilizzante naturale letame per sostituire i fertilizzanti chimici. Quindi bene la sostenibilità ambientale insieme a una sostenibilità economica. I numeri lo dimostrano. Italia, 
fitofarmaci meno 20% negli ultimi sette anni, antibiotici meno 42%, fertilizzanti chimici meno 15%, gas serra da settore agricolo meno 11%. E come si arriva ad ottenere questi risultati? Non certo tornando in un mondo primitivo dove c'è l'aratro di legno come qualcuno vorrebbe, ma con tecnologia, precision farming, l'Italia è diventato il secondo paese al mondo per automazione agroalimentare e robot impiegati nell'agroalimentare. Siamo l'ottava economia al mondo per PIL, ma terzi ultimi per emissione di CO2 perché produciamo emettendo poco e questo ci fa molto piacere. Che cosa succederebbe se invece prevalesse un approccio ideologico? Semplice, i nostri prodotti eccellenti diventerebbero, aumenterebbero di prezzo, sarebbero riservati ad un'elite di consumatori e per il resto dovremmo importare da altri paesi. Pensiamo al Mercosur, vedo una parte della commissione così entusiasta dell'accordo Mercosur quando invece sappiamo bene che in quei paesi non vengono osservate eh, le stessi, gli stessi standard. Questa slide che invece vediamo riprende un altro tema. Il eh, vicepresidente Timmermans ha poi fatto un passo indietro rispetto a queste dichiarazioni, ma bisogna stare attenti. Si può fare con queste dichiarazioni il gioco di gruppi privati che hanno interessi diretti e strumentali nelle filiere zootecniche. C'è una situazione, la fake meat, il fake cheese, in cui si vuole, e questo è un pericolo per tutti, staccare la produzione alimentare dalla terra, dai territori, dagli agricoltori e trasferirli all'interno di aziende, trasferirli all'interno di poche multinazionali di laboratorio che sostituiscono gli ingredienti naturali con gli ingredienti chimici e vengono quest vendono questi prodotti come miracolosi perché durati di dotati di claim eh, salutistici. Pensiamo alla fake meat in cui sono stati investiti solo nel 2020 3,9 miliardi di dollari con personaggi che si presentano come benefattori del mondo, penso a Bill Gates, e poi hanno importanti interessi in questo settore. Chiudo raccogliendo l'appello di Claire. Eh, siamo orgogliosi di quello che facciamo e della distintività con cui lo facciamo. Ci vogliamo fermare qui? Assolutamente no. Abbiamo tantissimo da fare, possiamo migliorare, possiamo migliorare l'impatto ambientale, possiamo migliorare il benessere animale, non racconteremo più l'eccellenza delle nostre DOP, delle nostre indicazioni geografiche, se non sapremo dimostrare il rispetto di norme sempre più rigide di benessere animale scritti in etichetta. Siamo pronti? Come Italia ci sono 700 milioni di euro nel recovery plan che il nostro paese ha già presentato che vanno proprio nella modernizzazione delle nostre filiere. Tuttavia abbiamo bisogno che gli obiettivi finiscano, ripeto, con l'essere ideologici, idilliaci, teorici, che ci sia una vera valutazione di impatto, quella fatta dalla Commissione per l'NBT, è, è fantastica, ha contribuito a superare discussioni di anni sugli, IGM, sugli OGM, ma oggi abbiamo bisogno di eh, calare all'interno delle nostre filiere perché il far to fork si fa dentro e con le filiere e non contro le filiere produttive. Grazie, thank, thanks to Luigi Scordamaglia and the message is quite, is, is quite clear, I think. Um, and now the floor goes to uh, Herbert Dorfman. Herbert Dorfman is a coordinator of the European People's Party for agriculture and one of the rapporteurs for the farm to fork strategy at the European Parliament. Um, Mr. Dorfman. Thank you very much, uh, Angelo. Yes, thank um, you. And what, what's the, uh, what, how is the parliament response, let's say the parliament position advancing on, on uh, and, and what, what do you think about the, the topic of today, the, 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 concer the concerns and, and of, of lack of sector on, on the farm to fork strategy? Right, good afternoon and thank you for the possibility to take the floor in this important uh, panel. Um, well, uh, what are we doing in the parliament? We are working uh, and we try to uh, uh, have a proposal 
ready to, to vote on it for the first days of June. So we have fundamentally one uh, month, to, month to go and we are working intensively, uh, me together with my colleague uh, Anja Hasekamp, uh, who is uh, taking care about uh, uh, is the rapporteur in the in the environment committee. Uh, I'm the rapporteur in the in the agriculture committee. But the works are going on quite well. Um, what do you think? Do, what do I think about the topic of today? Well, first of all, let me say two words about the strategy itself. I think. The idea or the proposal of the Commission, as Claire said before, to have a higher value food chain is fundamentally a positive approach. A positive approach for the consumer, but also for all the actors, because I think if there, if there is a, more, a higher value in a, in a production chain, this is also in the interest of all the actors, beginning from the farmers to the processors to, the, to who takes care of distribution and of the consumer at the end who is asking for a higher quality for the product. But it's clear that we have uh, needs in term of, terms of sustainability. Uh, we have to think about it. Needs in terms of biodiversity. We have needs coming from my, our climate obligations. And we have, and this is a positive thing, I think we have more and more uh, consumer behavior uh, which goes uh, in the right direction, which is asking for higher value food. But said this, I think we need to keep in mind two or three things. First of all, we need to do all this, keeping in mind the impacts our action will have. And therefore, as in the report I'm doing, I'm asking for a proper impact assessment, uh, impact on the sustainability. As Claire said before, there's not only a sustainability in uh, ecological terms, there's also a sustainability in economical terms and in social terms. But we have also responsibility to feed the people, our citizens in the European Union, and we have as, as, as um, um, as a um, 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 food chain in, in the European Union, an import, important uh, responsibility to feed the, or to, to help to feed the planet. And, and this is for me very, very important. We need to act based on science and not based on ideology. And if I read the strategy, I do not have always the impression that the strategy was always written with uh, science in mind, but there are some parts which I consider more uh, ideological than science-based. And here I come to livestock. I think it is, as Claire said before, and the clear also the president Dicea, it is a consumer choice in Europe if he wants or she wants to eat meat or not. Um, we know that uh, me, uh, too much meat has a, can have, an, have a negative influence on, on health, but it is fundamentally up to the consumer to decide if he wants or she wants to eat meat or not. Said this, I share the idea of the commission that we have some problems. And also the president, Scordamaglia, prima, uh, first uh, 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 remembered this. We have to think about our feed system in the livestock sector. Today we import 95% of the soya and 80% of the proteins from outside the European Union. And we have to reflect about this because I do not share all the opinion of Commissioner Wojciechowski about intensive or extensive livestock, because I think this is completely ideological. But we have to think what, or we have to define what is intensive. I think a, a, a livestock which is based on agricultural land, where there's a production of feed in Europe, and where there's first of all also permanent pasture, is not an intensive livestock. 
but we need to come back to use better our permanent pasture and permanent grassland in Europe. And we need to produce more proteins in Europe. And I think the, the, the new common agriculture policy and uh, especially the eco schemes can be very, very helpful uh, to get to achieve this, uh, this, this goal. And we have uh, this, um, we need to admit, we have a concentration of livestock production in Europe, which is connected with the problem I said before, that we are more and more importing um, proteins, especially soya from outside the European Union. And livestock and milk production is going more and more close to places where the soya comes in. So close to the big harbors in the North of Europe. And this is a problem. And this problem is connected with another uh, question, which is very, very important. What is what about nutrients? I think if we want to achieve the idea of the of this of the farm to fork strategy to uh, to use less fertilizers, we need more nutrients coming from livestock. And livestock can be a very, very important uh, um, uh, source of, of, of nutrients for the, not only for, for the European agriculture as a whole, but to have this, we need to have a livestock production, meat and milk production, um, distributed along, uh, all over the European Union. And we, can, we, we have to look at the fact that in some parts of Europe, we have less and less livestock, and in other parts, we have more and more creating a lot of, 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 uh, of problems for the environment. And to close, and this is a very, very important topic because I think also there's a bit of ideology and not that much science is the, the climate question. And especially the, the question of methane. Because I think on this topic, and we will have a hearing here in the European Parliament nextly, we need to have a very, very, careful scientific approach. First of all, we need to know how much of the methane which is in the atmosphere is really coming from livestock production and how much is coming from normal life cycles which are on this planet. Because in this planet, on this planet, there are not only cows and pigs from, uh, from farmers. On this planet, there are also six, seven billion people. There are a lot of animals which are ruminants, which are not um, uh, um, animals, uh, farmers, but are wild animals. So we have a lot of methane production, but methane is in a cycle and methane remains in the atmosphere for more or less 10 years. So we need to really to see what is this cycle and what is the contribution of a livestock production of, of animals, uh, of breeded animals in Europe. And it is too simplistic to say that all the methane which is in the atmosphere is coming from, 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 uh, from, from animals breeded by, uh, by farmers. And for sure, we can reduce methane emissions from animals. And there we have two very, very important tools. One, uh, which is called Amalia, we remembered it before. It is, it is the question of biodigesters. I think here we have a big, big opportunity in Europe um, on the energy side, but also on the methane side. And we, there's a lot of studies and, 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 and um, scientific approach going on on feeding, on feeds, on, 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 on how to feed animals in order to reduce meat and production. So it's much too simplistic to say that one kilo of meat creates X kilos of CO2. This depends how this meat is product, produced. This depends, first of all, how the animal is fed. And let me conclude with one remark which I consider very important. We have on the, in this European Union, millions of hectares of permanent grassland and permanent pastures. If we want to use this um, agricultural land 
to produce something, to produce food for our citizens and for the world on this permanent grassland, we need animals. Because I do not think that we, the citizens, we start to eat grass. If we do not have animals which can use this permanent grassland, the only possibility to transform this permanent grassland into useful um, land for food and feed production is transform it into arable land. And this would be the real disaster for climate change. So I think on the whole question of animals, of breeding, of um, uh, feeding and of uh, uh, climate change, we need to have a very, very proper scientific approach. And we find out that if we have a, a well done um, um, livestock uh, sector in Europe, we can, this can be very, very sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Doffman. Um, before uh, giving the floor to, to Gitte Gutland, I would like to recall that uh, uh, the interpretation is available um, at the bottom of the screen, uh, right part of the screen. Uh, you have a, a word like icon. You can select the channel in English or in Italian, and you can follow the, uh, the meeting in the language you prefer. Uh, now the floor goes to 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 Gitte Guteland, uh, MEP, uh, Environment Committee, S D S and D Group, and rapporteur on 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 the EU climate law. Um, Mrs. Guteland, what is your view on on the things you have you have been uh, uh, listening to today, uh, uh, and and on the, on the on the role of livestock sector in 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 the farm to fork strategy? Thank you. Angelo uh, for uh, uh, this introduction and also thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar and uh, uh, I really believe uh, it is uh, interesting uh, to listen to this uh, to the previous speakers and uh, also get the commission's uh, uh, perspective uh, in the beginning. Um, I, I, I must say it is lots of feelings here, and uh, I think also I might be a voice from a different uh, angle than uh, the last two speakers, maybe. And uh, I think uh, I feel a bit like uh, uh, I'm not always feeling that I'm I'm a very radical person, uh, but uh, today I think I have the privilege to to maybe add some uh, some of that. Uh, uh, I must because I'm um, I was the rapporteur of the climate law and I still am uh, and we, we have not uh, voted on the final result but we have uh, a deal from the trilogue so uh, I, I must say that it has been very intense this last year to work with the climate law but I also felt the historic moment that the European Union is going through uh, from its history as the coal and steel union to a climate neutral union and I really believe that the commission by launching the European Green Deal and also the flagship with the climate law has done something that's tremendously important for our generation and helping in helping this generation uh, who is deciding now to take important steps uh, towards a sustainable future and also take the global leadership uh, on how to do it, influence the whole world. And um, uh, one thing is clear, this is not only about reaching climate neutrality by 2050, it's also about the steps to, to go there and also respect the Paris Agreement. 2030 is extremely important. And it's very clear also in the climate law that every sector needs to contribute. And to 2030, we actually, if we also count what the commission will have as a statement uh, when we vote on the climate law, uh, that the Lulu CF needs to contribute more, and we will reach almost 57% net target um, to, uh, to 2030. And that is, of course, both the reduction and the removals. But it means that every sector needs to do much more for climate the upcoming years. And it means that we also will have uh, 
uh, re revised uh, uh, sectorial legislation in the June package. But I really believe that also agriculture sector needs a target uh, of its own to respect both the pathway towards climate neutrality and also the intermediate um, steps or the target that we have. And that means that we need to transist also this sector. And it means that, and that's where the radicalism is coming in, we need to do more when it comes to the livestock. And uh, I mean, the meat production of today is not sustainable. And I think actually it's not very fair to the farmers to say something else now, and then uh, it will be a completely uh, unsustainable situation. And uh, both citizens and the media and all the attention will be on this sector that it is the last remaining one who didn't transist. That will be a very harsh lesson. And it's not really uh, that kind of uh, words the politician level should give it should be very clear where are we going because if we don't do that there will be generations of farmers who will have big obstacles in the future and let not um, forget that already today farmers suffers from um, the uh, from the extreme weathers from the um, the difference that the climate is already the impact that the climate is already having on our uh, earth and our planet and I mean I come from a northern country but I see what's happening with forest fires that we have never seen uh, before in modern time and this is uh, due to the fact that we have much warmer climate also in in the northern countries and that said I believe that the commission with the farm to fork has really done a good job in pointing out what's important and where we need to go uh, there are points where we need to do more but I believe it's very clear that the message when it comes to um, implementing the whole chain from farm to fork in the in the green deal is a clear message from the commission that we need to listen to and make sure that that we have a sustainable chain and that it's part of the european green deal i also believe it's good that the commission points out the the waste of food as an extremely difficult and and uh, also enormously waste for climate uh, that that we have that situation that almost a third what could be on the plate is actually lost on the chain towards the the plate and uh, we need a better target there and uh, and uh, that is something that the commission should uh, point out of course i believe it's important that the biodiversity is so strong also in the farm to fork and i also uh, endorse or like the fact that the commission sets the target to 2030 on uh, on the um, uh, chemical um, uh, um, uh, uh, target when it comes to minus 50% to 2030 on the pesticides. I think this, this is good, uh, but I also worked with the sustainable use directive and I know it's extremely difficult to get this in place. So I think what needs to be talked about is on how to do it, actually. So it's not the pace, piece of paper uh, that it's actually done in the member state and that we help farmers to really accomplish this. And there, I think there are many ways we could improve the implementations. Uh, but today, that is not the case many times. Uh, the first alternative is... is uh, to, to use chemicals that is not sustainable. I mean, we need to find other ways here. Um, then I would like to say that um, uh, I also think that uh, I'm happy that the commission mentioned animal welfare. Uh, that goes hand in hand with uh, a new model, I think, for, for the cap uh, that is more sustainable with less meat production, of course, but also, um, a better awareness of if we keep animals so tight together, we will have problem with anti, uh, the antimicrobial uh, resistance that is there. So AMR is really important for Europe and for us as human beings. 
And I, I like that the commission addressed this. And I think we, we can do more the upcoming year to, to help human health, to help the animals, of course, uh, to better um, conditions, uh, and also make sure that this is part of the more sustainable future. And last but not least, to the farmers and also everyone who works in the food chain, you are the heroes, of course, of, uh, of our daily lives, part of why we live. Uh, food is the source of life. And um, it is, of course, for that reason, so extremely important that we have a sustainable future and that you can live of uh, what's... Uh, uh, what will uh, finally end up in the consumer's uh, plate. And I think that will best be done actually by having uh, a new direction for Europe uh, where it will not be cheaper and cheaper to buy meat is one example. Uh, that will not help farmers to survive. Uh, we need to have better incentives uh, that will make sure that we cannot have that development that has been going on uh, for years now. Uh, so I believe we need incentives uh, to help farmers uh, be sustainable and continue important work that's been done by generations. But I never want a farmer to think that they are part of the problem. They are part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you to the Gutteland and uh, the, the, the... I give the floor now to Pekka Pezon and that represents also the, 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 the farmers and uh, agricultural cooperatives uh, organizations in uh, Brussels, uh, the Copa in Kojika, uh, Pekka Pezonen. Uh, uh, so farmers are part of the solution, uh, but, but something has to be done. Something has to change. This, this is, if I may, some some the, the the meeting up so far this is the things that are emerging pekka thank you very much angelo and thank you very much for the kind invitation it's it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, after listening to the distinguished speakers i would be very much interested also to make the make my contribution um, as you mentioned i represent copa and Cosega. and we in return represent farmers and the agricultural cooperatives from all sectors different production methods, ranging from, uh, let's say, plant side, arable side, all the way to livestock and some special special sectors, uh, all production conditions, small, big family cooperative farms. And we are there to deliver food security and everything that goes with it. And in particular, in line with the consumer expectations. And this is actually the big trend that we, we would expect that even more so would strengthen itself. Uh, I would like to point out that most farms have developed their production uh, and the sectors uh, over the over the generations. There are very few farms that have maintained the same sector or same production method, um, and they, therefore, it's I find it safe to say that as a farmer is a farmer is a farmer. But the common denominator across the generation is to make how to make it work socially and economically sustainable, and now also environmentally sustainable. I come from Lonlang and Finnish farmers in my native Finland, and I can tell you that it is my privilege and my responsibility to make sure that the farm that my, my previous generations in my family has, has farmed will be left in a better condition to my, my uh, kids. I hope that some of them will continue farming, but then we'll see what choices they make to their lives. In EU agriculture, including livestock, uh, we've been very successful in producing high quality, nutritious, affordable, safe, and sustainable food. In fact, we have managed to decouple some environmental impacts from production. Our greenhouse gas emissions have declined while our output has increased, in particular in livestock production. But the next step would require more attention, more investment, more technology, and importantly, more innovative thinking. And from the economic point of view, farmers are all too often price takers, given the price pressures, in fact, declining farm cage prices in real terms. The only way forward is to improve productivity, cut costs per unit produced. Until now, these gains have almost exclusively been challenged, challenged to the benefits of the consumer. 
Contrary to some claims, our food has never been so safe, high quality and affordable as it is now. But we talk about future, how to do better. And this is why we welcome this initiative and this event uh, that has been organized. The Commission has set up some very ambitious targets in its European Green Deal, and in particular in its farm to fork strategy. We in Copacosaca would be very supportive to the general principles of enhancing sustainability, but we have repeatedly asked the how part, how to do it. Things are developing also internationally. The European, uh, while European Union is considering its, its own approach, for instance, the UN is planning for a food system summit in September this year, to which we will contribute from Copacosaca and together with our uh, colleagues uh, across the world. But the Commission is not very committed to the means of making these ambitious objectives a reality for farmers. Redistributing the declining direct support is not an answer. We need some concrete assistance, for instance, technologies, infrastructure, enable a digital agenda, or improved value chain arrangement in the EU policies to make the necessary investments into more sustainable production. In fact, some Commission representative statements last year questioned the past performance of the Commission, uh, other inst EU institutions, national authorities and stakeholders like farmers. We have developed our food, food systems and the future will be built on them, not on some imaginary ideological approach. And this is particularly a concern on food safety. We have done a lot. We cannot throw it out of the window. While targets are set, the political statements ignore the farm level reality in organizing production in natural, sometimes unpredictable environment. Pest or disease won't simply disappear. And especially in livestock sector, we quite often forget that when the animals get sick, they need to be treated. It, in fact, it is an obligation that we need to take care of them. We need more sustainable alternatives in a very concrete way. A political ambition do not recognize this reality. And this is the reason for us to be so vocal in the means to achieve the ambitious targets. But on the more positive note, I have to give credit to the Commission on the recent New Genomics Techniques report. It sets the scene in a fairly balanced manner, and we hope that this would be listened, uh, by, uh, listened to by the other institutions and other stakeholders. European agriculture and its livestock sectors are very much committed to a more sustainable future for us all. In planning for that, we must recognize the huge economic importance that agriculture and livestock create at farm level through added value and employment opportunities, but also across the whole food value chain, not only on the farms. The deep interwoven structures and interdependencies between the main sectors plant and animal side of production must be taken into account. And this is the reason for us to call for an impact assessment that could and should have been conducted according to the original plan of the Commission services last year. Cutting livestock production in the EU does not lead to, wor to world peace. It would seriously disrupt the fine-tuned value chains with our agri-food sector. And we also very much inter uh, connected with uh, the rest of the world in our economy, including agriculture. Disrupting that in agriculture will lead to international consequences that call for science-based decision-making in our EU bubble. And this is a weak point for European Union politically. I would point out that well above 80% of our total protein feed intake comes from the borders, within the borders of the Union. We often forget our own arable sectors, such as cereals and in particular grasses, rough feed for ruminants. All too often, we talk about the concentrated raw protein rich fraction that we have to import for agronomic reasons. We are simply not competitive enough to produce soy equivalent proteins for feed purposes in the EU. But this needs to be addressed too. And this we, we challenge our other stakeholders and EU institutions. Can we do something about this? Over the decades, the EU agriculture sector has proven to be dynamic in its response to the society's expectations. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has also demonstrated our resilience in providing food security to hundreds of millions of EU citizens. What we need from the EU is the enabling policies 
for EU agriculture to, the ma to make the necessary modifications to maintain our European decentralized model of agriculture, a model that would sustain world-known culinary, culinary heritage, contribute to wider economy in rural areas, support circularity, and respond to the future expectation of consumers. Thank you very much for your attention. And thanks to Pekka Pezonen. I've been informed that uh, uh, Herbert Dorfman MEP and uh, uh, Gitte Gutland MEP has, uh, have to leave uh, at four. So two quick questions for you. Um, Mr. Dorfman, you talked about uh, the, the, the need to review the relationship between climate and meat production, actually. What do you think, uh, what, what do you mean exactly? Is this something, are you proposing a, a EU study or a, confront, a, a dialogue with, with, uh, with the UN experts? What, 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 I, what do you have in mind to, 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 uh, to rewrite this, this balance, as you say? No, I think we are very often simply too simplistic. And with this, I recognize that uh, we have uh, production patterns in Europe today, Uh, which I indeed, um, or where indeed we produce a lot of, 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 of uh, climate gases, so a lot of CO2 and a lot of methane. Um, but on the other side, we need to really look how we produce, uh, what, what is, what, uh, how we feed the animals, um, and which animals we have. Um, and what what we what, how, if we have for example biodigesters or not, and I fully agree with what Becca said before. Um, there there is there can be a sustainable livestock um, uh, production in Europe, and the, I think the our one of the of the uh, let's say of the. Uh, organizers of this of this uh, evening uh, of this event, Asukarni, has a program on this, and we need to look at this, and we need to 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 find out how how we can improve, uh, because I think we have to acknowledge that on many things we can to, uh, we can improve, but this simplistic idea to say a lot of meat is a lot of climate change is simply too sim is too simple. Uh, things are much more complicated. Uh, uh, nature uh, is a complicated thing, and we have a, we need to have a proper scientific and not ideologic look at it. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks to to Herbert Dorfman and to uh, Gitte Gutland. Um, uh, rural areas are, 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 are fragile fragile areas by by a social point of view, and every transition comes at a cost. Um, What's, what's, how to ensure that this transition, the green transition, uh, is something that uh, benefits the rural areas and, and don't uh, jeopardize their development? First of all, I truly believe that uh, we need to have a very strong uh, farming sector in our member states in the European Union. And uh, I believe that that will be uh, for the future also more sustainable to have locally produced food uh, since today many times we transport food that and we don't count the price for the climate of that, those transports. So I really believe that uh, it will be extremely important also for the future to secure uh, 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 opportunities for, for the countryside uh, in our member states and also for the farmers to, to live on, on their uh, land and be able to, to contribute also to the food chain. But that said, the, there are many studies that showing what meat means for, for the greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions that um, we see today and uh, I, I really believe that it is not easy but we need to both have better techniques better production uh, uh, methods but we also need to eat less meat and actually pay for the meat that we that we would like to eat and I don't think that should be controversial anymore it should be a very strong signal uh, both to the consumers but also for incentives economic incentives uh, for those who who, who uh, transist their production model 
to better benefit the environment and health, uh, they should not uh, be sacrificed. They should actually improve also their economic benefit from that. So I, I really believe the cap reform is really important to help farmers to do that transition. Um, but it should. I, no one is saying it's easy, but I, the, the, the situation we have today, and I can uh, conclude by saying there was a farmer telling me um, some year ago that I, I have my father, he had, um, had 70 uh, pigs, uh, I have 700, and my younger neighbor, the next generation, he has 3,000. And we are just working to, to survive and make uh, our family survive from the work we do. Uh, but is it really sustainable to have that development, that you need that to be able to support your family? Uh, it's something completely wrong with that system. And with these happy words, uh, <laughs> I... <laughs> Normally, I'm more happy, but I will also. I said some happy things uh, in my first intervention, so I need to go now. But it was a yes. privilege to listen. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and MEP, for having uh, taken part in this uh, in this uh, event. Uh, now, uh, if uh, no, Mr. Doffman is not is no longer there. Um, question to Mr. Scordamaglia. Uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, there is a, there is there is a need of of numbers of data of of an impact assessment and and you were not the only one actually also also Albert Dorfman uh, mentioned that uh, so a question uh, for for an entrepreneur for a food producer why is so important to have an impact assessment because this has been one of the recurrent issues in the farm to fork debate there are targets but we have no impact assessment why is it so important to have an, an impact assessment from your point of view from the point of view of one that is producing food yes thank you very much uh, let me mention some data that uh, uh, claire very already mentioned at the beginning in 2017, the value of livestock production in Europe was uh, 170 billion euro, 40% of all agricultural activity. But more important, uh, 4 million people directly um, employed. Uh, and if we consider also the indirect employment, uh, the livestock sector in total employed in Europe, uh, nearly 30 million people. So do you think it's possible to ask for a revolution in this sector? without a serious sort of economic impact assessment? I don't think so. I think that is unacceptable that the only economic study that we have today on the effect of the farm to fork strategy on the European agri-food chain was made by USDA. USDA just to understand the benefit that would uh, um, derive to the American farmers. So impact assessment must be a priority. Second, I take the occasion to answer some, uh, some uh, other observations. Um, Pekka already underlined the importance of how food security became central after the pandemic. We need to remember after the pandemic, Mr. Putin introduced the duty of over 50 euros on exports from Russian wheat to avoid exports. Do you imagine in future if we don't have enough food, if we don't have enough uh, animal protein, China introduces a criminal sanction for those who waste food. So it, uh, we need an evaluation of social, economic, and strategic impact. Just to mention on the meat consumption, uh, for sure, we don't want to sell cheap, very cheap or cheaper beef uh, or in, in too much quantity. We know to sell, we want to sell right quantity and right quality. Just to mention the Italian data, if we consider the real consumption, the real edible part of meat, we uh, have a daily consumption of beef and pork red meat of less than 75 grams. That is lower, one fourth lower the recommendation of the WHO. So uh, we need balance. And also regarding 
the, the declaration of Mr. Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Doffman. I absolutely agree that uh, we should be as soon as possible uh, less dependent for animal feed uh, from other countries. But not only in this case, we need to be coherent. We cannot say we want to improve our impact and then we allow import of millions of tons of uh, animal products from Mercosur with an agreement that allow import without any kind of street uh, regulation. The last point, uh, I promise, the last uh, to uh, answer to uh, Miss Gutland, uh, remember, and uh, uh, we need scientific uh, uh, debate, 85% of CO2 emissions come from fossil fuel. We accumulate fossil fuel for million years, and in hundred years we use. So we want to improve, but the way is not the e as a, the equilancet people traveling in private jets. That that uh, uh, it's more than uh, all the bovine population of a single country in terms of the CO2 emission, and then just say eat less meat. So. We need coherence, we need scientific data, we need impact assessment. Thank you, Luigi Scordamaglia. I am asking questions in the reverse order, so um, I will go forward with uh, Mr. Pesonen and then Mrs. Bury, and then we will open the floor for uh, uh, question and answer from the participants. Um, Pekka Pesonen, uh, what do livestock farmers need? in order to achieve the, the ambitious targets of, of the, of the farm, farm, farm to fork strategy. Um, I mean, we have talked about incentives, the, the, the need for incentives. What kind of incentives we, we, the, the farmers need in your view, from your point of view, of, for your point, from your point of observation, actually, that is a privileged one? Well, um... I would say that there's this one word that I would like to plant in your mind in this respect, and that is the consistency, policy consistency. Because what is happening now, and none of the speakers, including myself, actually address this, is that while the European Union has said very clearly that we need to become more sustainable in, in agriculture also, and, and we need to address, for instance, human health issues, and consequently, we need to um, reduce red meat consumption. This was what Madame Kiriakides quite recently pointed out. But let's take a look into the policy framework that the, the individual farmers have to operate on. The farmer, considering possible investment for future development of his, his, his or her sector, would consider, let's say, the various aspects. And for instance, animal welfare is a good example of that price level of food, uh, let's say the, the meat that he or she would get would be another. But importantly, let me simplify. The, the beef producer in the European Union would be asked to become more sustainable and make the necessary investments in, in his or her farm. But at the same time, the commission says that you have to consume less meat, red meat in particular, and we make trade agreements with third countries that actually increase our offer in the marketplace to keep the prices down. So how does it work at farm level at the end of the day? So we are going to introduce more products to the marketplace to push the prices down. We expect that you make the investment to meet the, the sustainability standard for climate change or animal welfare. And we are going to cut the CAP support in as a whole so that where do, where do the farmers get the the, the necessary additional income. That's why they have to go for the for the increased output, because they have to cut for the for the for the cost side, per average uh, per, per, per kilogram produced meat. And when we asked this from the commissioner, Commissioner Wojciechowski, he didn't he couldn't answer because and he doesn't manage the trade aspect as much as the trade commissioner. So the consistency of the EU policy is crucially important for the livestock sectors. If we were really to reach for the sustainability targets, please take into account that these policy items come together at farm level in many respects. And if the policies are not consistent, 
we will not reach the target. It's that, it's that simple, consistency. Thanks. Thanks, Pekka. Uh, Claire Bury. You have, you heard a lot of uh, a lot of uh, of things today, I think, and uh, for some of them, the the, the commission has been uh, called to 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 reply. I think to, uh, I I re I refer to the to the impact assessment, but also the pol policy cons consistency is 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 a is a very good point. So, um, what's what's your What's your what are your replies so far? Well, what what can you say on on these um, issues that have been raised today? Okay, thanks, Angelo. There were there were a lot of good things said about the commission, but there were some uh, challenging things as well. So I will try to as uh, usual. I just bask in, I just won't <laughs> just bask in the uh, limelight of the good things. I will try and uh, answer those where uh, where people were were less happy, of course. Uh, I mean, on on this question of a, of an impact assessment, I think we've said this several times before that um, the the farm to fork strategy is a policy document. Huh? So it sets out uh, policy objectives and and. and it, and it enumerates the different actions that we'll come forward with. But obviously all of those actions will, will have impact assessments. So if I take one example, uh, the Sustainable Use of Pesticides Directive, you have to mention that as well, um, where we'll have a proposal by the beginning of next year. Of course, if that proposal sets um, a target in terms of getting rid or reducing by 50% the use of pesticides, then we will have to impact assess it. Huh? So there will be impact assessments uh, on anything that we put into law and anything that becomes uh, a legal obligation. But we're not going to impact assess the strategy as, as, as a whole. I don't think that makes much sense. It's only a political, it's a, sorry, only a political document. Not, I mean, it's an important political document, of course, but uh, we wouldn't uh, do an impact assessment of the, of the strategy as such. Uh, I listened very carefully to what Pekka was saying. Um, and if Commissioner Wojciechowski couldn't answer, then I don't know whether I'm going to be able to answer any better, but perhaps I can give some other examples. I mean, of course you're right, Pekka, uh, to uh, call upon the commission and the policymakers to be consistent and to do things in a joined up way from a policy perspective. Um, and we do try to do that. And we increasingly try to do that, I think. If I can take, um, again, uh, pesticides, for example, which are mentioned in the farm to fork strategy, uh, there we are quite clear that if pesticides are prohibited within the EU, then we should no longer set maximum residue limits for imports from outside the EU. We should also uh, make that prohibition apply to products that are imported. Now, as you know, and, and you know as well, probably even better than I do, Pekka, that we have obligations that we've undertaken in the WTO, um, and we have to make sure that we comply with those obligations. Uh, so if it's, for example, um, you know, if we're talking about neonicotinoids, where it's very clear uh, that the threat to, to pollinators is something which is now recognized as a matter of global concern, uh, then we think that we can justify this according to the, to the WTO rules. But we do have to show that we've tried to engage uh, with third countries and that we have set out our arguments and that we've had a dialogue uh, before we take action. But that's exactly what we're in the process of doing as far as pesticides are concerned. Um, animal welfare, uh, we're going to face similar challenges. I mean, listening to what's been going on in the parliament, um, I'm sure all of you have been hearing it as well. Yitta mentioned that, um, of course, it's very important for the parliament uh, at the moment, and we have the end the cage age petition. So if we do uh, decide and the commission will come forward at the beginning of June with its response to the petition, um, and if uh, there, the Commission says that the EU should commit uh, to uh, phase out use of cages for, for certain animals, uh, then of course we know that this may have an impact on our farmers uh, because it will make, uh, they will certainly have to adapt their production over a certain period of time, of course, uh, maybe even need to have some, some financial assistance for this, but also we need to think about what's going to happen in relation to imports. So, so we will address that. Um, so Pekka, we're not perfect. Uh, but I hope that in some areas we are trying to get more, more joined up. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, Angela, if I may, just briefly, is this question uh, of uh, research and innovation, because I think, Pekka, you mentioned that too. Um, a, a number of speakers have said how, how important it is for farmers you know, to be able to innovate and to be able to make the most of the digital transformation. So we, we fully agree with that. And there are, I mean, this, this is the way I think that we can help farmers to square the circle uh, by making sure that they are able to innovate and by giving them access to innovation. You know? 
Um, so we have, uh, uh, under the common umbrella of the European Innovation Partnership for Agriculture, uh, the CAP and Horizon Europe, these programs are meant to work in synergy to offer opportunities to farmers so that they can embrace the double green and digital uh, transition. We also have something which is called the Agricultural Knowledge Innovation Systems, uh, where we foster knowledge exchange and so on, and where we will be holding member states to account in terms of what they do in their, their cap uh, strategic plans. So I, I certainly buy your argument that, that farmers need concrete assistance. They don't just need promises. We, don't, we shouldn't just talk about how good innovation is and, and how useful digitization can be. We actually have to make sure that they have access to the solutions and that we're helping them get access to the solutions. On digitization, um, we haven't said much about uh, the, the challenges for new generations of farmers, but I think I saw something this morning which surprised me, which was that the average uh, age of a farmer in the EU is something like 53 uh, years old. Huh? Of course, I can say because I'm not that far away from that myself, but this is this is actually uh, it's, it's young in some ways, but it's still quite old in others. Um, and I think only 5% of the farming population is below 35. So we really need to encourage young people to come into this. And I think that one of the ways uh, to do that and to have more young farmers is to make sure that they have access to digitization and and the, the, the benefits of technology. And that's why one of the key things that we said in the Farm to Fork strategy uh, was that by 2025, we should make sure that rural areas as well have access to ultra-fast broadband. Thank you. And this, this is one of the, of the uh, let's say, forgotten targets because the, the, it is not a, of the farm to fork. It is not never mentioned in the debate. The, the, one, one of the targets is about broadband in rural areas, actually. Exactly. Um, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm so question and answer from the participants. Uh, I'm receiving question and answer the, the question. Sorry, that uh, um, uh, may be uh, uh, pertinent to the CAP. Uh, I'm receiving the 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 rural question on the rural development incentives for animal welfare um, from Manuela Scornayengi, um, but I don't know if there is anybody here that can reply. Maybe maybe. Um, Claire Bury or, or, or Pekka, I don't know, uh, uh, animal welfare in rural development. Uh, can... I can I can answer very generally if you like, but I don't know, Pekka yeah. might want to add something as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously I this is um, this is something that we're discussing with uh, the colleagues from DigiAgri in the context of the end the KJH petition as well, which is this link between animal welfare uh, and the CAP. And I think um, you know, we need to make sure uh, that as we go forward, uh, and we're going to revise, by the way, not just the question of, we're not just going to look at the question of cages, but we're going to revise the whole animal welfare legislation, looking at transport and looking at welfare more generally, uh, that we need to make a clear link uh, with that and the CAP. Now on this, I mean, Commissioner Wojciechowski has been very vocal in the parliament as well. I mean, he's a strong believer uh, in the fact that we have to uh, improve animal welfare and that really it's, it can be only beneficial for farmers if we, within the EU, if we work towards better uh, animal welfare. Uh, a question. Oh. Angela, oh. you've got to mute. Huh? <laughs> I was, I was doing the opposite. Um, there are several participants that ask, uh, asking that. Uh, and it has been mentioned, and also Luigi Scordamaglia um, mentioned it. Uh, a question to, to, to to the three of you, um, uh, make meat more expensive. Is it a solution? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will start from, uh, who wants to start? Pekka. Well, um, I would actually like to, uh, to answer the previous question in terms of animal welfare. Um, of course, if I may be a bit provocative, um, if the consumer wants us to treat any all animals individually as pets if you are willing to pay we will do it but the point here is that nowadays this initiative on, on the uh, ending the gauge uh, gauge era and um, we have uh, recognized that there is a is a wide call in the society and therefore we could support this but there are uh, certain preconditions that we need to discuss first of all for the investment needed we need financing and transition period and it's not going to happen tomorrow because we have been investing heavily into the existing legislation already. And these investments are really crucially important for farmers. Um, secondly, we need to recognize once again 
that uh, the the trade is not that simple to sol solve. If we go for the gauge ban, how are we going to impose that on imports? And the question that you asked, Angela, is actually the next one, meaning that if we go for a higher cost of meat, most probably uh, there will be some changes to the consumption. Perhaps some cons consumption will will reduce. But importantly, if we go for the ban on gauges and we insist that the farmers make the, the reinvestment in the coming years, most probably we will see once again a further concentration of production, which is seen negative in the eyes of some industrial farming. We would not go back to the semi-subsistence farming because the, the, the economics are still not there, even if we have a slight increase in the beets meet uh, uh, the farm gate prices. So what would happen to my constituency and our farmers is that we will once again hit the mainstream farming community in producing high quality foodstuffs and in this case, livestock products. And there will be consequences. And so therefore we can say that, okay, if this is what the commission, uh, this is what the society wants, secure sufficient transition financing and consistency with the international trade in, in particular, we can talk about it. But there will be changes to the production and market to the extent that most probably some of the consumers would not like. And this needs to be recognized. And it will be a severe blow to my membership and my members, farmers that are in the mainstream production facilities, especially in, in, in laying hands and pig meat. It will be further concentration. Is this what we want? Thanks, Pekka. Uh, Luigi Scordamaglia, from, from the point of view of, uh, of an entrepreneur of the sector, yes. uh, is, is the price of meat something that can turn the page on, on, on sustainability? Or it... Yeah, uh, it's not an easy question because uh, for sure the price should be the right price to pay for the higher standard that the farmer in Europe has to follow to produce beef. So when people complain, because in the CAP, there, there are subsidies for the livestock, they don't understand that farmers in Europe has to follow higher and higher standard. And uh, the consumer can pay part of it, but not, not 100%, because otherwise, if you increase uh, the price of beef uh, at very high price, uh, only a sort of uh, elite of small group of consumer can afford it. And then you have to import from other continent that uh, uh, don't follow the same rules. So uh, it's important to increase and to have the right price because today farmers are not paid enough. The price of beef uh, of a carcass kilo, if you compare, is the same of 35, 40 years ago. And this is not possible, so we need to increase. And today there is too much margin from the distribution chain. So it's a question of balance, it's a question of right price, it's a question of subsidy. Regarding the uh, animal welfare uh, subsidies, uh, for sure, uh, there are in the second pillar. There are, uh, as I mentioned before, in the uh, recovery plan, we put a lot to modernize also for animal welfare, but the strongest request is from consumer. If you are not able to follow the needs in terms of uh, animal welfare, you are out of the market. Claire Bury, as we see, as always, uh, uh, easy questions, questions that seems easy, uh, are complex, uh, require complex <laughs> answers. <laughs> so, meat uh, price. Well, yeah, this is a, this is a difficult one though. I mean, I think uh, at the end of the day, and it's in what Luigi uh, said, uh, that food needs to be affordable for all. So I don't think we can say that, you know, the answer to this, uh, all this is to make meat more expensive. I mean, there, there were other questions in the chat about meat generally and how healthy or unhealthy it is. I mean, uh, there is proof that eating too much meat is unhealthy. No, eating over a certain amount, there are recommended amounts uh, of meat and eating too much uh, is not good. Uh, 
uh, because it's too much protein and it's too much fat. We decided to take a very balanced approach in the farm to fork strategy. Um, because these issues are complicated, we, we didn't set a target in terms of reducing the consumption of meat. I mean, we just put forward the idea that there should be more uh, fruit and vegetables more um, and more legumes, and there should be less meat uh, eaten. I think we need to recognize that this is, this is a very complicated question. And I don't think we should look at it just in si simplistic terms in terms of saying make meat more expensive. Okay, I would invite, we have five minutes left before um, launching, the, before handing, ending and launching the, 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 the video again. Um, I would propose that um, every one of you uh, gives uh, uh, two minutes of uh, uh, closing remarks to, the, to, the, to this uh, event. Uh, who, wants to, who wants to go first? I, I would start from uh, Pekka. Thank you very much. Um, Two minutes. Like I said, um, it's, it's up to the consumers to decide what they want, and we are there to deliver. It is very much linked with the affordable food, like my, my colleague Luigi pointed out. We cannot create uh, extreme markets, one for the, for the upper classes, um, uh, products that uh, the rest of the population cannot afford. It needs to be affordable, where European Union actually has demonstrated its strength. We have nutritious food available for all. It's more to do with the moderation of all foodstuffs in general. This is the same, for instance, for alcohol drinks. So we need to make sure that the information coming from the farm level to the consumers is there. That's why also we need the digital agenda. We need those tools available for consumers to verify what the, uh, what the food is, where does it come, uh, come from and how it is produced. That's why we talk about the infrastructure, for instance. Luigi Scordamaglia, from your point of view, did you, did you have, uh, have, have you gathered replies to the, the concerns of the sector uh, in, today? Uh, I'm very happy. I'm very happy because uh, today uh, we had the opportunity to have a very uh, direct discussion on rational scientific data. And this uh, uh, doesn't happen very, very, very often. Uh, again, we need to keep out of the discussion, the ideological aspect. We have a distinctive model for the agro-food production in Europe. We need to be well aware of this value, is a value for everybody. We need that uh, for the consumer and for the producer. We need to have a sustainable uh, improvement in terms of sustainability. We are all uh, already a distinctive model where we can improve, but again, we need to consider a competitive sustainability, not ideological or greenwashing. And uh, again, I think uh, one of the uh, main instruments of growth for for, for Europe, for, for uh, European companies, European lifestyle model is our agro uh, business model. So don't throw out and uh, together try on a scientific base to improve step after step, defending this model also from dumping that we receive every day from other countries, from other continents, other, from other third countries. Claire Bury, your concluding remarks. Okay, thank you, Angela. I'll be very brief. So I, yeah. I think I go back to what I said before. <laughs> there are no sustainable or unsustainable food sectors per se. It's about sustainable and unsustainable business practices. I think livestock is at the set is at the center of the EU's agriculture uh, and of our food chain, and therefore it's going to be part of the solution. It's not the problem. And I'm I'm sure that the sector is going to con continue to pursue its efforts uh, towards sustainable production. Thank you. And I want to thank all the participants to, to, to this event, this smart event. Um, apologies for those uh, that uh, were not able to, to ask their questions. So we were not able to um, deliver them because there, there were many of them. Um, but the time is over. Uh, uh, thank you again to uh, Claire Bury, Pekka Pesonen and Luigi Scordamaglia. And thank you for EU News and Carni Sostenibili and European Livestock Voice that have organized 
uh, this uh, uh, smart event. Uh, before leaving, uh, I launch again the video uh, produced by uh, European Livestock Voice with nine paradoxes of the farm to fork. Uh, it's available on YouTube on, in, in, in seven languages. Um, enjoy the video and uh, see you next time. Thank you all.